Mailman doesn't let anyone use the elevator. I make him regret that decision. Gather round, children, as I tell you the tale of the time I nearly threw up, sprinting up seven flights of stairs. So yesterday, I was returning home with a heavy bag of groceries. As I approached my apartment building, I saw a delivery man with a parcel trolley waiting at the door. I decided to open it for him so he could get in while I checked my mailbox. As I entered the building, I heard him get on the elevator. He must have heard me enter the building as well, but he didn't bother to hold the lift for me. No big deal, I'll just wait for it to come back down. The elevator stopped on the fourth floor, and I noticed it stayed at the fourth floor for a lot longer than it normally should, almost like it was stuck. After a moment, it started moving, except instead of going down to me, it was going up and stopped at the fifth floor. Again, it was stopping for an unusually long time. It was at this point I realized that the courier must have been holding up the elevator doors with his trolley so that they couldn't close, meaning the elevator wouldn't move on. Annoyed because I have a heavy bag of shopping, I live on the seventh floor and we only have one elevator, I was even more incensed when I saw the elevator carry on going further up and holding at other floors. At this point, I'd been waiting for a good couple of minutes. So, I decided to take the stairs to the seventh floor. However, I ran as fast as I could. Why? Because the elevator was coming down to the 16th floor, and on my way to the 7th floor, I pressed for the elevator on each floor I passed. If he enjoyed holding up the lift so much, he could spend extra time in it on the way down. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm as lazy as it gets, and now I'm feeling the pain in my thighs from my Stairmaster challenge, but it felt worth it. I waited in the stairwell and listened to the elevator stop on my floor, doors open, doors close, stop on the 6th, and so on and so forth. When it hit the 5th, I could just about hear the courier say, for frick's sake, as he realized no one was getting on the elevator. I was out of breath and had a good sweat going on, but it was worth it in the name of pettiness. Am I the jerk? I mean, I don't know that the delivery guy in question was so much of a jerk as he was just kind of inconsiderate. But surely, he must have considered that in the time to go up 16 floors and stop a minute or two at each, you're definitely going to hold up and inconvenience multiple people. And I don't know if this is one of those Amazon couriers who's going to be disciplined if he doesn't make his deadline and has to pee in a bottle while he drives, but honestly, if you're going to do this kind of thing, for all you know, you're making elderly people wait 15 minutes or more on their feet for the elevator. It's a mixed bag, and this is the definitive petty revenge, so let's just enjoy that aspect of it, as well as the fact that our protagonist was inspired to commit to more exercise than they'd undergone in their life to get their own back. When you do know the owner. I'm not a server, but I have a funny story that involves an owner and a Karen. So where I live, there's this really good coffee shop that makes amazing coffees as well as amazing food. My mum, who's lived in the same town her whole life, knows the owner and she introduced me to him and we have a chat when I'm there and he's around. So one day I'm at the coffee place and this woman comes in and she's rambling on the phone to her husband about how she needs to get some K-cups for the house because they ran out. So I'm sitting there minding my own business when I hear her huffing and puffing and me, being the idiot that I am, decide to go help her. I'm well known at the coffee shop and they don't mind when I help people out because it honestly looks like I work there and they don't have to pay me. So I ask her what's wrong and she says that the K-cup prices are ridiculous. As an aside, they're not. This lady then claims that she knows the owner and if I could ring them up for her for free, because the owner always does that for her. I know that's not the case, but I decide to ask her her name just in case she does know the owner and maybe they can work something out, or I can have a good laugh afterwards. This lady looks at me weirdly at first and then tells me she doesn't trust me and she'll go look for him herself. I roll my eyes and walk away, knowing exactly where he is, and I walk over to him, telling him the situation, and we walk back to Karen. I ask the owner if he knows her, and he says no. She looks dumbfounded for a second before walking out of the shop after putting the coffee cups back. Sometimes it's nice to actually know the owner. Yeah, it's a gamble to make that move in a store where you don't even recognize the face of the person walking up and asking if you need their help. Nice try, jerk. I'd say that you can't blame this lady for trying, but these people walking around and just trying to deceive staff members into getting a discount leaves a real bad taste in my mouth. 
What if the owner is a jerk and the staff member gets in trouble because you lied to them? In any case, it's quite funny to see this kind of person just alt F4 out of a social situation without even acknowledging everyone. Like a kid who started losing their Dota match. It's nice when we get to see grown adults letting out their inner child, isn't it? You'd kind of wish that they'd just be more sporting and pay the extra money for that one time, though, because driving to Walmart or wherever and buying the K-cups there is just going to cost them time and petrol money at that point. Just admit defeat. Apparently, she was certain I was under 18. She didn't even ask for ID. I'm a 22-year-old, 5-foot-tall woman who wears glasses most of the time. I have contacts and makeup, but I only use them when I'm going to work, school, or at a formal setting. It's weird how a little makeup, some contacts, and a little extra maturity can magically make you appear your age or even older to people. I guess Clark Kent's disguise means a lot more than I thought. Strangely enough, I get excited when asked for my ID. I don't know why for sure, but I think it's because I like to blow expectations and get a funny reaction out of people. This one moment I'm about to share is one of my favorites because I wasn't even asked for an ID. They thought they wouldn't need to. I was at a craft store with my sister a few months ago, buying a few things for various events and holidays coming up soon. One of these events was an anime gaming convention that my sister and I like to dress up for and attend every year. My sister was planning to cosplay as the main character from Vinland Saga and needed some things to make the knives the character wields. One of these things was silver spray paint, which she had dropped into my cart when I wasn't looking. In my state, spray paint is one of those items that you have to be 18 years or older to buy and have a valid ID to prove it. I rarely buy items with restrictions like these, so I'm never really prepared to have my ID ready to prove my innocence. I sent my sister to the car while I checked out, since I thought it would be quicker. While the lady was checking out my items, I was digging for my wallet and card to pay when I hear... I can't sell you this. I look up and see the lady holding the can of spray paint my sister was going to buy and looked confused. She then said, I can't sell spray paint to people under the age of 18. It's illegal. It took a moment for the statement to sink in before I laughed out of pure amazement. I've never looked so young to someone that I wasn't even asked for ID before. I didn't even feel offended, just amazed. As I laughed, I started pulling out my ID while saying, You'd be surprised at how many people think I'm that age when I'm actually 22. The lady saw my ID and her face turned to a look of surprise and embarrassment. She started apologizing while finishing checkout, but I told her it was fine before leaving. Best can of spray paint I've ever bought. Maybe I should do that more often. I don't think anyone is really a jerk in this story. This lady was just doing her job and got a little more presumptive than most. I feel like a lot of the power-hungry, petty counter-jockeys we've had in other stories would take it on themselves to be the ID police and declare that you were using a forgery to obtain your contraband spray paint. This lady was just embarrassed, and she course-corrected after her slight jumping of the starting weapon. No harm, no foul. Also, who doesn't carry around their ID with them at all times? Maybe this is a guy with pockets thing, but I honestly never leave my house without mine. Then again, in my country, you can use it in most stores and services where you have memberships or accounts, so it might not be as applicable to this young lady from the States. If you like Am I the Jerk, you're probably going to love Am I the Genius. Check it out, linked below. Also, go to amithejerk.com slash submit if you would like to submit your own stories. I sued my boss because he fired me for wanting to attend a concert. First up, some backstory. During my gap year between studies, I decided to work for Company N. Company N was run by a husband, Dave, and wife, Karen, with their son, and basically they treated their staff like a small family. All was well for about two months until I realized I had to ask for a day off since I wanted to attend the last Slayer concert the band would give in my country. There was about a month to go, so I sent an email asking for the day off and explaining why. This is where everything started to go downhill. I got a reply from Karen, and her reply was weird. She stated that's not how asking for a day off works. I was confused, to say the least. Not sure what to do, I thought she wanted a more formal way of asking, so I wrote a formal email asking for the day off. She shot an email back saying that I really had to think it through what I was doing, which made even less sense to me. But I was hopeful since I never really got a specific no. 
The next workday rolled around. I arrived, locked up my bike and headed inside for work. I immediately started looking for Dave to ask for answers. But before I could even open my mouth, he asked me, Do you still want to go to that concert? I didn't expect him to ask this so quickly and answered, Yes. The only thing he said back was, Okay, take off your vest and you can go home. I was stunned. And while the words started to sink in, I looked at my colleagues which were just preparing for opening. When it finally sank in, anger flowed out. I'm not a confrontational person, so I simply took off my vest and gave it to Dave. Without a word, I left and started biking home. When I got back home, I told my mother what happened. We started sending emails for extra information and got very Karen-like emails back. After a couple of emails which basically went nowhere, I looked up the laws for immediate dismissal. After reading up about it, I learned that in my country, someone can only be immediately fired when caught stealing, frauding, the person isn't able to do the work, or refusal to do the work. I didn't do any of these. A day or two later, I met with my attorney and began the steps to sue Company N. I told my lawyer what happened in detail, and he was very confident I was in the right and that my boss was not. So, after trading even more emails between the three of us, we went to small claims. I came prepared in a suit with my attorney in tow, and Karen showed up alone. I guess she assumed she won because she thought she was in the right. The trial began and I was as professional and objective as I could be. Karen did the same, well, for about half of the trial. When she realized evidence was piling up against her, she resorted to calling me a spoiled brat, among other things I don't know the English translation for. Safe to say, that was the point the judge ruled in my favor. As per usual, I had to wait a month before I got the verdict, black on white in the mail, but I won. It may have taken about six months from the moment I was told to go home to the point those six months of pay were transferred to my bank account, but it was 100% worth it. In the end, I went to the concert, and it was the most awesome and profitable concert I've ever been to in my life. In short, got fired without a valid reason and sued the company for it, and I won six months' pay. Yeah, I don't understand what the employer thought was going to go on here. Look, maybe we can say that they assumed that like the majority of cases, the fired employee wouldn't try to sue and just spend their time trying to find another job and recoup their losses. But then Karen shows up to court acting like this is all a done deal in her favor. These people just seemingly had no idea that workers have rights. Perhaps if things were really so perfect there up until this incident, that might go some way to explaining why they were so hilariously uninformed about the fundamentals of holidays and the hiring and firing of their workers. In any case, terrific that you got six months of wages for very little effort on your part, and we can only hope that they look up laws and treat their employees better going forward. Entitled Mother wanted me to let her kid color in my book. This happened yesterday. After work, I had to take my car to get it inspected. An oil change and a car wash. I knew that this might take a while to get done as I was going after work and it might get busy. I planned ahead and brought with me my sketchbook and nice colored ink pens. I'm a doodler, so even though I'm not sketching profiles or landscapes, I'm still drawing mandalas and things like that. Things that take a lot of time and effort to make. Skip forward to me sitting in a busy waiting room. The couches are all taken, so I grab a seat at a table, which is actually preferred since I'm sketching. I first noticed Entitled Mother and Entitled Kid sitting on one of the couches. Entitled Mother was scrolling through her phone while Entitled Kid was complaining about being bored because they'd been there forever. I pull out my moleskin sketchbook, black ink pen, and start working on a doodle that I've been working on for a few days now. A few minutes later, bump, 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 and I hear the pitter-patter of tiny, entitled kid feet come up next to me. What's a drawing? I'm working on this doodle, and I showed it to her. That just looks like a bunch of weird lines. Followed by long silence from me. Can, can I draw too? Do you have your own paper and pens? No. Then I guess you'll have to wait until you get home to draw. But, but you have extra paper and pens. Let me use them. You're supposed to share. Sorry, kid. These are my things, and I don't want you using them. This is when the kid starts crying. The crying is what cues the entitled mum to look up from her phone, finally. The snotty brat runs over to mum and says, That mean lady won't let me color in her book. Mother gets up from her seat and comes over to me. My kid wants to have some of your paper and pens so she can color. 
You need to do it because she's bored. No, these are my things, and I have every right to not want some random child using them. I then tried to explain to her that I don't like ripping pages out of my sketchbook because it might ruin the integrity of the book, and that my ink pens are somewhat expensive, which means I don't want other people using them. All reasonable answers. But oh no, there was no convincing this entitled lady. She went off about how I wasn't actually drawing real art, and how her precious daughter needs entertainment, and that I have to let her have some paper, or else she'll tell the manager of the car place. I was starting to get really ticked off, but I just grabbed my things and moved to an area of chairs that were on the outside patio type area. Thankfully, the mother's car was ready soon after, so she ended up leaving, but damn, I was afraid she wasn't going to let go. And given some of the stories we've encountered here before, you were very right to have that fear. It was completely ridiculous of her to make her demands that way to begin with, but I guess you can count your lucky stars that at least this wasn't one of those crazy women who end up calling in nearby security or even the cops to resolve the fact that the world doesn't give them what they want sometimes. Also, a tip for any of those who want to grab free art supplies, don't insult the artists that they're currently in possession of. It won't grease the wheels of the transaction the way that you all seem to think it will. I assume that this garage had a printer or fax machine and some pens at the desk. Why not try asking them for some A4 and blue Bix for a few minutes to spare everyone else from Tiny Tina's rampage? Best college speaker ever. When finishing up my degree in criminal justice, we had to learn about how the justice system works and how sometimes it doesn't. For about two weeks, we studied a case from the early 90s of a woman who had killed her husband. Because the case is public record and a very interesting read, look up Betty Freiberg, 1993. The setting was a small Iowa town, and the husband was the town drunk. Everyone in town knew him for a drunk, a brawler, a womanizer, and overall just a bad guy. His wife was a stay-at-home mom, as she wasn't allowed to work or leave the house, aside from getting groceries. He would go home, be violent, and commit the unspeakable act, and the cycle would go on and on, and the whole town knew. The neighbors were a quarter mile down the road, but would still call the police when they heard noises. It was well documented, and because he was never a threat to their daughter, the police did nothing aside from taking him to jail like a revolving door and each time he got out, the whole thing would start again. Their daughter was away at college but came home for Thanksgiving. While the father was at work, the daughter told the mother that her father had also committed the unspeakable act against her and that she'd even had to go to a clinic to get rid of a pregnancy because of it. This was the breaking point for the mother. She got her revenge 1,000-fold. When daughter went back to school after the holidays and the husband came home, our lady killed him with his hunting rifle at the kitchen table. The table is important because it was a big farm table used for chopping up deer and other livestock. Doing the butchering was her job and she was good at it. If I could find the case report, it has pictures of the table and clear marks of chopping. She chopped up her husband and scattered his body over neighboring farms and fed what she could to her livestock and cleaned up. Months went by and winter came and left. Police investigating his disappearance even questioned her while sitting at the same table drinking coffee. She explained the marks on the table by explaining that she had butchered her own meat and showed the officers her deep freeze. The investigation went on for months until finally a neighbor's dog brought back a body part. They identified it as belonging to him and she was arrested on the spot. She pled not guilty and refused any offers. It went to trial and 12 of her peers judged her not guilty due to extenuating circumstances. She confessed to the crime, explained why she did it, and how she had no real choice because no one was going to help her. The farm was hers, and she refused to give it up as it had been her family's home. She was let go entirely for the murder charge. The next week, we had Betty as a speaker to the class to discuss the case, and she was awesome. At the time, ironically, she sold dismemberment insurance for Aflac. Betty, if you ever hear this... No, you're seen as a figurehead for battered women, and you pulled off the best revenge I've ever been able to study. Holy crap, Betty! I can't even blame her. It sounds like she did the world a favor. I'd argue that I'm not sure it equates to a 100-fold revenge, given that it sounds like he was being a horrible human being for many, many years before finally being bought to task. 
But also, I wouldn't want to wish on Betty the task of extracting the full, equal punishment for everything he had done during his life. She quickly and cleanly rid herself of a problem, and it seemed like none of her peers or even the local officials took much issue with the way she did it. It's kind of hilarious that she ended up selling dismemberment insurance, which I didn't even know was a specific kind of insurance one could take up until reading the story. I wonder if they hired her based on her experiences or in spite of them. You never know with these local celebrity types. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications. Put the playlist on in the background to finish listening to all the stories. Or if you want to check out some great music, check out easymode.com. If you like Am I the Jerk, give Am I the Genius a shot. Everything linked in the description.